Hey everybody, JB back with you once again for another board game cube shelf run through video. This is going to be the sixth and for the first row at the very least, the last video on this level. Uh, the next one we're going to climb up to the second tier of shelves, but we're going to be finishing this off this time. So let's go ahead and get started here with this game over here called Las Vegas Royale. Now a lot of the games here on this particular shelving unit are pretty easy and accessible. And this one might be among one of the most accessible and really fun with some pretty incredible decisions to make. It's published by a company named Aaliyah. And I don't really normally follow them much just because their component quality is kind of eh. Um, and their games are normally not my thing. But this particular one really captivated me. Basically, um, this is the kind of game you're playing here. It's an area control game, which is not entirely what you might expect upon hearing the name. But the premise of it is very simple. You're just trying to win these uh, pots of money here at the various casinos around the table. And there are six of these things, each of which corresponds to one of the faces on a die. On your turn, you roll all of the dice into this dice tray, and then you pick one number all of which you are going to put into the corresponding casino. So in other words, if I rolled a whole bunch of dice and three of them were fives and I picked five, I would have to put all three of those fives into the five casino in order to assert some dominance basically in that area. Now what's interesting about this decision is of course by doing that, you are denying yourself three dice to use on future turns, but the double-edged sword is that you can kind of dissuade other players potentially from wanting to go there since you have such a strong hold on it. The other wrinkle in the game is that if you tie in any given casino with another player, both of the tied or all of the tied players are effectively eliminated from that casino and cancel each other out, and someone could just slip in there. So if two players had three fives in here, someone could just come in with a like one five and just slip in there and get the money. It's really cool, and I love the fact that the money increases at each casino. You randomly pair up uh, sets of cards, and then you arrange them from lowest to highest. But the one that's the higher money amount might be a little higher than the one that's up next, depending on how evenly spread or non-evenly spread they are. So you may want to go for the four casino more than the six one, for example. There's also these chips here that you can use during your turn, where if you roll the dice and you don't want to play any of them at all, or if you just want to wait for someone else to make a decision, you could just play a chip and skip a turn. I really like that a lot because, again, it kind of adds to that ebb and flow of wondering, okay, is this really the right time to do this or not? Um, and then the deluxe version of this game, the Royale part of it, adds these tiles that you can put around the lower number casinos to add just a little bit of extra spice, a few little rules just to make these lower number ones um, more juicy so you can just go in there and do something special. I really like this game a lot. It's a very accessible game. Uh, even if you don't like dice-based games because normally they involve a lot of luck, I really do think this one is worth your while. It's a great family game comes with my highest recommendation. That is Las Vegas Royale. All right, we're about to go into these four games here, all set collection-oriented games from Renegade Game Studios, who has a really good track record with simple and accessible, yet uh, really deep, in some ways, games. And this one right here, Lanterns of the Harvest Festival, is actually one of the first modern board games I added to my collection. This game is a very simple rummy style uh, set collection card game where you're trying to earn these score tiles by building sets of cards that match the conditions here. So for example, this is uh, one of every color, this is three pairs, and that's four of a kind. And the way you get these cards is really cool. There's this Carcassonne style tile map in the middle of the table that you're building out, and every turn at the very end, you place a tile onto this grid. The trick with this, though, is that everybody around the table gets the card of the color facing them. So let, let's say I was sitting here, I could get white, and then Bob is sitting here, he gets white, Mary is here, and she gets um, uh, red, and then Jenna is over here, and she gets green. There's also a really cool bonus opportunity if you can match colors where when you put a tile next to an existing one, you can get that color. So Jenna will get green, but I'll also get a green as well. 
I really like this game. It's got a very accessible set of rules. It's kind of a little samey after a while, though, so I'm not sure how long I'm going to keep it. But I did get the expansion to it, which I still need to get to the table. So I'm, I'm really hoping I can do that sometime, because I really want to check out what that adds. It's a really neat game. Uh, if you're looking for something that's set collection oriented, but it's not Ticket to Ride, this is a really good one to check out. It comes in a nice little box. That is Lanterns. All right, this game right here was kind of an unexpected surprise. It wasn't on my radar, but I looked into it after hearing some good things, and I ended up really enjoying this one a lot. It's called World's Fair 1893, and it's, by, it's designed by a guy named J. Alex Kevern, who is a designer who likes to combine mechanisms, I've noticed. He, he enjoys doing that. And in this case, the mechanisms he's combining are set collection and area control. So much like Las Vegas Royale, this game has this sort of wedge pie kind of shaped thing where you're putting in pieces to assert dominance in that area, except instead of dice that you're rolling, in this case, you're putting a cube down. You're putting a cube down and you're getting cards, and these cards can be used for special powers. They can be used just to get straight up points, or you can collect sets of these exhibit cards that you can then turn into these chips if you can gain control over the, the uh, corresponding color area. So, for example, if I had this red card, I want to turn it into that. I'm going to have to put a lot of my cubes into red in order to really do well in that. There's also these really cool power cards with people on them who can help influence the organization of the World's Fair. And these people can help you add more cubes or move cubes around. It's a really neat system. And it plays very smoothly. Like when I, I've explained this game to people, and I think that it's kind of one of those things that takes a, a couple of turns to get because it involves kind of like phased turns. But once you get into the flow, it just, it's so fluid. It just moves along at such a nice clip. That is World's Fair 1893. Great family game. Speaking of family games, this one right here is such an underrated gem Spy Club. Uh, this is another game Renegade produced in conjunction with Foxtrot Games, who does a lot of really cool family-level stuff. This is a cooperative game where you're playing as kid detectives trying to solve a neighborhood mystery. Think of, like, Encyclopedia Brown, kind of stuff like that. I really like, um, well, many things about this game. First of all, the presentation is is superb. I really enjoy just how cheerful and bright this is. It's not anything serious, like a... You know, you're not dealing with murders or anything like that. You're just trying to solve a mystery around the neighborhood. I will say, though, that this game is at its core a set collection card game. You're trying to collect all the cards of a certain color when you're trying to solve that particular aspect of the mystery. So purple, for example, is the who the suspect is, who the culprit is. Um, there's not any logical d deduction involved. You're just putting all the cards out there, and then you draw a card that tells you um, the symbol, that's the answer. Some people may not like that, but I love the fact that you get to kind of piece together this really crazy story about how your mom was the culprit and she, you know, robbed the game store because she was jealous of the owner and, and stuff. It, you know, it, it's really silly stuff, but it's really funny to make up and tell stories about. Uh, and I love the fact that this game uses a really cool system of examining cards as the method through which you can collaborate the, uh, with the other players. So, for example, if I wanted to trade these idea tokens, which are kind of like the currency of this game, with somebody else, we can just look at the same color thing. And in, like, kind of like in real life, that would be being on the same page with somebody, you know, trying to talk about the same kind of thing you're trying to solve for. So I like the fact that there's a little bit of thematic stuff in there, even if this is kind of abstract. But what the real star of this game is, what makes this really shine, is this thing. So this game comes with what it calls a mosaic system. And this is a way to play through a campaign of five different games that use up to 40 different modules. So you're going to have to play at least eight different campaigns to see all the stuff in this, in this box. I've only played through one campaign, and I'm probably going to do so by myself here throughout this quarantine thing. Uh, maybe this weekend, actually. But what this does, what's really cool about this, is that you play through five games, and each game, one of the aspects of the case that you solved, you are going to promote to be a part of a master case that you're building. And there's even a little bit of story and flavor text that you get on some of these cards. 
I love that how this comes together because you could be like, oh, you know, the game store was the location, you know, that was used in that one case where mom robbed the game store and all this stuff. But ooh, we found something there that suggests the game store is a part of a giant conspiracy and, you know, all that stuff. I love this. It's really neat because it adds special powers to the game. It adds some additional rules or objectives. So it's not just all about putting the cards out into the middle like this. It's a really neat system. I will say it's not necessarily one of those things that's quote unquote set in stone, so to speak, where it's like a story that you're uncovering that's intentionally written with a certain order in mind because you're trying to layer these elements on top of each other, which is why they call it a mosaic thing. So you can discover all this stuff in any order and you're ultimately kind of writing the story yourself. So not everyone will like that. But I do like what it does. It is an interesting concept. And for that reason, I've been keeping it. It's a, also a really easy to learn game too. So that is Spy Club. All right, the other game by J. Alex Kevern is this one, Sentient, which is a game about building cool robots. This is a game that's also flown under the radar, I think just because it's been a little expensive to get a hold of. I think that's because it includes these custom engraved dice, which, you know, are a little bit pricey, you know, when you're doing special dice like these. But the game itself is very interesting. It's kind of a little mathy, but what you're doing is that you're playing three rounds and you're trying to get these robots hooked up to like a corporate network. It's pretty abstract, but what's really cool about it is that the robots give you points if the mathematical statement in them is true with respect to whatever dice they're referencing. So for example here, this card says left die plus right die must equal seven, and we can see here that we have a four and a three, which really helps a lot. Um, this one says three, so you just have to have, you know, either one or both dice needs to be three and you get points for that. This one is like this left die is less than the right die. I like this game because there's two layers to it. There's the layer of having to plug the cards in, and there's these little modifiers in the corners where you have to adjust the dice accordingly, so you want to watch out for those. And you can put these little gears to help prevent that when, whenever you don't want it. But then on the other hand, you're also sending out these pieces for this little bit of area control where you're getting the cards, but you're also contributing to influence with respect to these corporation tiles, which match the colors of the suits that the cards use. And these are ultimately, at the very end of the game, scored such that they multiply by the number of cards. So, for example, here, you know, this player has two of these military ones and two military cards, which is four points. Uh, but if they can get another military thing up here, that's yet another one that multiplies, which means they can have six points. I really like it. It's a different puzzle every time. It's got a really neat sort of... Um, set of rules that aren't really too complicated, but yet the decision making that you're doing is very crunchy, and that's a really neat thing, I think. I My one complaint about it is I wish that the cards didn't repeat artwork, like you'll notice here that this card of the purple suit and that purple card are the same, and that's the case throughout the whole game. It's kind of a bummer, but it's a very minor complaint. Otherwise, this game is a lot of fun. That is sentient. Okay, now for a game that I am planning to sell to a friend here. This one's called Reef. It's put out by a company named um, Plan B Games, who has an imprint called Next Move, which you can see there. They publish these games with four characters in the title, uh, their most popular one being Azul, which is a tile laying game a lot of people have heard of. Uh, but their mission with this line is to create games that are very accessible and very simple for families. This one is certainly in that category. It's got this premise where you're building a coral reef, which normally takes a long time. But here you can do it in 20 to 30 minutes. You have a board that's a 4x4 four four grid, and you can stack these reef pieces on top of each other up to 4 high. And on your turn, you can either draw a card from the, the sea of cards that, that are available into your hand, or you can play a card from your hand. And when you do that, you can draw pieces from the supply and put them on your board and then score using a condition down here. To, and if you fulfill the condition, how many ever times you do it, you get that many points. So in this case, this player has one of set of those things, they can get five points, but if they had another one, they could get 10. 
I really like this just because it's simple. It doesn't really take a lot of time to learn. I basically just explained the main rules right there. And basically anybody of any age could play it. Great game. I'm selling it mainly just because there's another game that I'm, I'm going to be going over later that's kind of replaced it for me. But don't get me wrong, this is still very, very solid and a very fun time for all ages. Okay, and then finally we have one of my favorite games. Uh, this is in my top ten, possibly even in my top five. And that is Clank, a deck building adventure. Deck building is a mechanism that really took off, especially in 2008 with the release of a game called Dominion. Dominion was a, a card game where you would start with this deck of cards, draw a hand from it, and then play the cards to buy more powerful ones that you can then add to the deck, and you would eventually get more and more powerful as you reshuffled and reshuffled. It's a really fun game, and it has a lot of variability, but what I like about this game, Clank, is that it takes that concept of deck building and it puts it into an actual board game with this map that you traverse. You're an adventurer who's trying to raid a dungeon and steal some treasure from this dragon here. So think Bilbo Baggins and Smaug from uh, The Hobbit. I love the fact that this game has this escalation of tension. The deeper you go and the more you push your luck, the more attention you're going to attract from the dragon because a lot of your cards and the things that you end up doing are going to add cubes called clank to this pool here, which is noise that you're making, thematically speaking. And whenever you draw cards from the, the, like the card market that have this dragon symbol on it, the dragon's going to attack and you're going to have to put all the cubes into a bag and draw whatever number of cubes is on the space that the dragon's sitting on. So the more you collect treasure and do things, this dragon's going to move up and you're going to have to draw more cubes. If you draw dragon cubes, then nothing happens. But if you draw your own player cubes, then you're going to take damage, which is not good. And you could potentially die if you're really reckless. So you have to be very measured about what you're doing. I think one of the things I really like about Clank is the fact that, uh, to put it in terms that designer Jamie Stegmeier has um, framed, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of his games later on, a lot of deck builders have this kind of bell curve of progression where you're going up and you're getting more and more powerful, but when you, you peak on that curve, you start buying these point cards where they give you points, but at the same time, they kind of clog up your deck from a functional perspective. You really can't do anything to gain more cards with point cards. This game has a bell curve, but it's dictated by the dragon, where you're forced to actually physically leave this dungeon in order to escape, and that's, for the most part, what dictates the end of the game. It's not necessarily you getting point cards, although those are available. It's a very neat system. I love the fact that it comes with a, a double-sided game board. You can buy expansions that are more maps to it. There's even um, a spinoff called Clank in Space, which has like a modular board and its own kind of expansions that a couple of my friends own. And uh, last year, they had a legacy version of this game called Clank Legacy, which included permanently modifiable components and a lot of other cool stuff as well, which I haven't played, but I'm very curious about it. Clank is just an excellent game. If you are looking for an adventure-themed game, it's a very fun and very tense, and you're just going to be holding your breath as those cubes are picked out from the bag. So cool. I Very few game experiences have matched what Clank has done for many of my groups, and I really appreciate it for that. All right, so that is all for this shelf, everybody. Next time, we are going to move up to the second uh, row of shelves here. And uh, we're actually going to go all the way to the left here, which I will show next time. But until then, thank you all so much for watching. I really appreciate your support on this series. If you enjoyed yourself today, don't forget to hit that like button, comment and subscribe if you haven't already, and ring that bell to get notified of the next video. But until then, thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.